Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a bit scared after this performance, but I'm encouraged because we've never had, I believe, such a nice compliment for our report. We have spent hours and hours to uh, design a front page of the book, and yet um, you prefer this very serious, down-to-earth typeset front page, which actually pays tribute to the scientists who have worked on this report. Thank you very much for this compliment. <laughs> so, I was given the charge here to uh, tell you a little bit about these long hours that I've spent in Stockholm without seeing this wonderful city. We sat in this uh, old brewery for uh, four days, um, very few hours of sleep, and we approved this report on Friday morning, five o'clock. Then uh, the technical support unit spent a very, very busy two hours to make sure that no mistakes were transferred from the working document to the document that was then printed, given back to the few remaining who were not asleep, and then we could approve at 7 o'clock in the morning. So it was really a very long, long process, but basically the value of this process was that a few very simple key messages are now approved for the first time by all the governments participating in the United Nations. I think that's a big achievement. It was painful, but it was very worthwhile. Essentially, these key messages say, we know it's happening, we know who's responsible, and we have a choice. So, but of course, it's not that simple, but that's the essence that is in there. How did this all happen? It didn't just happen by bringing to the policymakers two pages and say, look, this is very nice. Wouldn't you agree with that uh, uh, document? Could you not uh, perhaps uh, endorse it? No. Three years ago, four years ago actually, the governments themselves said, we would like to know about the state of the climate system. What can you scientists tell us about the problem of climate change? And not only warming and sea level rise and changes in precipitation, but also more comprehensively, the reaction of ecosystems to potential changes or the options that people have to mitigate climate change or to transform technology. So, in fact, there are actually three working groups who all have and do work hard towards their assessment. We are done with that. We have approved it on Friday, yesterday, I believe, because I've lost track of the days. Um, for the first working group, that was the physical science basis. The second working group and the third working group, they will issue their reports around March, April next year. So in 2009, we were charged. We worked out basically an outline of what we have to assess. We then selected about 260 of the best authors we could find around the world, top leading scientists who are willing to dedicate their time, free of cost, not paid, for this assessment effort. This assessment effort is actually quite painful because I know of no other document that has undergone such a deep scrutiny. We received 54,677 review comments. Essentially, anybody could log into our homepage, say, I'm an expert. They would get ex access to these reports, could send us comments. Um, we got some comments like, goes like that, um, uh, to install credibility in this enormously important body of IPCC, please change your report so as this report concludes that the world is not warming. Things like that. <laughs> so parts of these comments are actually in that number, but these were very few. We got many, many very valuable comments, and that also 
proves that this is not just a report by two or three activists. In fact, we have taken great care to select the authors that do not have a history of either activism at both ends of the spectrum. 1,090 experts have given us comments. All these comments needed to be addressed. These comments were given to the 14 chapters. The chapters range from assessing what we know about the observations, what we know about the understanding of the climate system, and most importantly, what the potential futures are. A very new, innovative element of this report is this Atlas of Regional Climate Change Projections. That means that these scientists have compiled an atlas, again, for everybody to use free of charge. You do need to know a little bit how you access electronically these data files. I would know how to do it, but you can actually plot maps of changes in temperature and changes in precipitation for all regions of the world, for four possible emission scenarios, and for several time horizons in the future between now and the 21st century. This is an incredible achievement, free of charge, ready to use for everybody, for all governments and those who are interested. Now, out of these, actually, a million one hundred and forty thousand words in our report, we distilled a summary for policymakers, which contains now, after these four days in the brewery, fourteen thousand words. So we got in the brewery inspired to add a thousand words. We went in with 13,000. We came out with 14,000. And this summary for policymakers is this uh, unattractively but uh, nicely presented and complemented document that Hans Rosling um, referred to. For me personally, the most important achievement in these four days is the fact that we have 19 headlines. These headlines are now endorsed by all governments of the world. They fit on less than two pages, and I believe they can be understood. I now show you a few of these headlines. For example, here you, show, you see the temperature changes in the past 150 years, shown as 10-year averages for many different time series, but they all tell you the same thing. They say each of the last three decades has been successively warmer at the Earth's surface than any preceding decade since 1850. Now, just to tell you a little bit how that process went in the brewery and what we actually did in the brewery, I can tell you that this word here, successively, came in at the suggestion of a delegate of a government. After probably about 10 minutes or 15 minutes of discussion, interventions, I want to say something, I think this, and so forth. And at the end, they thought, yes, that's exactly what we want to say. Successively warmer, these three decades. But we package these three decades into one group. We do not say, this decade is the warmest. And watch out, we are more robust, a little bit more conservative, but I think more grounded. This is another uh, headline that is in there that gives you the uh, longer term context. In the Northern Hemisphere, the last 30 years was likely the warmest 30 year period of the last 1400 years. And you see this strange addition there, medium confidence. This is really to give the policymakers a warning flag that science has not yet fully analyzed every detail of it. But we are, we do have confidence to say something that is useful, although only with medium confidence. The next figure, this is one of the figures that we uh, decided to insert in this summary for policymakers, which has 10 visual figures, um, is the face of the Earth. The face of the Earth now, relative to 100 
and 30 years ago. You see here the temperature increase, a map at the surface of the Earth, since 1880. And the view is very clear. Almost all locations of this planet are red. Red means it has warmed. And in fact, this leads us to a very strong statement, but that's not new. That was already in the fourth assessment report. Warming in the climate system is unequivocal. Now, the next question, of course, is why has it warmed? Who's responsible for it? And this is a little bit more complicated. We know that since 1951, it has warmed by about 0.6 degrees Celsius. Now you say, that's not a big number, but remember when you take the temperature of your baby, you care about 0.1 degrees Celsius. 36.9, it's all okay. 37, hmm, I better watch. So a tenth of a degree means something to us. That is the statement, and we know that is the observations in the graph above. You see the temperature scale on the horizontal, and we now consider different possibilities that could be responsible for this temperature change that is observed and given in the black bar. Now we know from many studies that the amount of greenhouse gases, and that is not just CO2, but it is also methane, nitrous oxide, and a few other trace gases who have essentially the same effect on uh, the radiative balance in the atmosphere, they account for about 0.9 degrees Celsius. So, a little bit too much, so there must be also cooling agents in the atmosphere. And that is precisely the case. There are other anthropogenic substances like aerosols, dust, other chemicals that act as coolers. And you see, they take the temperature down again by about 0.2 degrees Celsius. But you also see there is a large uncertainty with this little error bar, we call that, a large uncertainty associated with this yellow bar. So we're not so sure about this, how much really they contribute to the cooling. So the green bar plus this yellow bar together, that is the anthropogenic forcing. And you see this anthropogenic forcing, strong warming, a little bit of cooling, almost precisely matches what we observe. Then there come people who say, it's all the sun. Oh, and volcanoes, they emit so much CO2. Could that possibly not explain what we see? Well, of course, the scientists had to look at that question as well. And they found that both the nat natural variations, volcanoes, solar, but also internal variability, like, for example, a hot Pacific Ocean every three to seven years, they do not account for more than 0.1 degrees Celsius. So what you have before you is actually quite a convincing story. And that is why scientists decided to put this sentence in the summary for policymakers. It is extremely likely that more than 50% of the warming since 1951 is due to the increase in greenhouse gases. Now, you agree with me, this is a complicated sentence. And every communicator would um, throw this sentence away. It's true. That's why, for the first time, even in a summary for policymakers, we have even simpler language. Human influence on the climate system is clear. And that sentence, I could gavel down, I don't rem remember whether it was Wednesday or Tuesday night, with the agreement of the governments present. So this is now a sentence that all the governments endorse. There's no discussion anymore. Next was then to look into the future. You see here, uh, graph that shows you the evolution of the temperature as simulated by a large number of the best climate models available from 1950, precisely that time that we looked at before, 
to the year 2005, and then two lines that go up. Both go up, but the blue one sort of comes to an equilibrium, and the red one continues to grow. This is the change in surface temperature over the coming 100 years for a high carbon dioxide emission scenario. That would be the result, the response would be the red one. And for a low emission uh, scenario, that would be the blue curve. As Hans Rosling already said, these scientists are not always certain. And that is the shaded band that accompanies the line. That is the uncertainty. But of course, we did not stop by just showing two possibilities. You have more possibilities, and these are the little bars on the side that give you other scenarios that may be relevant or chosen by the world community. This results in a simple statement. Global surface temperature change for the end of the 21st century is likely to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius relative to 1850 for all scenarios. So in other words, this 1.5 degrees Celsius, that's not a coincidence that we choose this number. It's one of the goals that are, or targets that are uh, discussed at the higher level of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's the lower of the two targets. And we now must say, unfortunately, that it is likely that this temperature will be exceeded. There is a slim chance, but it would require two things. It would require immediate reductions in carbon dioxide emissions, and it would require that actually the climate system is responding a little bit weaker than we think our best estimate is. This graph has already been shown. I don't need to go into that. Global mean sea level will continue. That's very evident from this graph. We can quantify it for that low emission scenario, something between 26 to 55, and for the high scenario, the upper end up to a meter. I now come to the last figure that you will find in this summary for policymakers. And this is, uh, some people say this may be a game changer, uh, I don't know, but it is a figure that we uh, who have prepared this summary for policymakers have for a long time had a, a bad stomach feeling. Not because this figure is wrong, this figure is very robust, but because we thought the governments might not like it because it has such a powerful message. So what do we do? We plot on the horizontal axis all the carbon emissions that have been blown out into the air since industrialization. Every tree that has been cut, every brick of coal that has been burned, Every liter of petroleum that has been used, that is summed up, and that is the so-called cumulative total anthropogenic carbon dioxide emission from 1850. In units that are obscure, we were told by the governments, uh, PGC, petagrams of carbon, we had then to change that after what was it, 20 minutes of discussion. In the end, we said, OK, let's go to the old unit you are familiar with. Um, it's just different. It's the gigatons that uh, the governments like. Um, we prefer the petagrams, but that's, it's not relevant. It's the same number. So that's the horizontal. And then on the vertical, we show the temperature change since that more or less same date. 1860 to 1880, so a long time ago, essentially where the footprint or the handprint that was so nicely displayed in this experiment, I've never seen that because I could talk for about a half an hour about this experiment. It's really fantastic. The fingerprint uh, was not visible on a global scale in these greenhouse gas concentration. So these are the two axes, and what you see now, if you do 
the historical account of what happened until the year 2010. Where did we fare here on this curve? 1890, 1950, 2000, 2010. So there is a clear relationship, a proportionality between these two quantities, between the total amount of emissions and the warming. It's actually fairly linear. And now come in these four scenarios that I've mentioned already for temperature and sea level rise. And if you march here along these four scenarios, you see it's a little bit uh, busy, this graph, but essentially you cannot distinguish these four scenarios. They all point into the same direction. The only distinction that you might recognize on this graph is where these scenarios stand at the end of the 21st century. So the low emission scenario at the end of the 21st century stands here, just about below 2 degrees and below 1,000 billion tons of carbon emitted. Whereas the high scenario in the year 2100 stands up here, where you are above twice that amount, 2,000 billion, carbon, billion tons of carbon um, emitted, which would create a warming of about 4.5 degrees Celsius. So we are on this trajectory that shows a very clear path our choice is where we stop on this trajectory, and where we stop on this trajectory is actually decided which, by which scenario you choose. So, if you choose the low emission scenario, you stop here. The highest emission scenario, uh, you stop there. This convinced the policymakers to actually endorse this sentence as well. Limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. So the end message here, the take home, we do have a choice. It's our choice where we stop on this trajectory. But where we stop on this trajectory, you don't decide in 2100. You would have to decide that now. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>